I am delighted to be interviewing Dr. Scott Scher right now, who is an internal medicine doctor, and he specializes in hyperbaric oxygen therapy. If you have no idea what that is, that's fine, because you're about to find out. It uh, has tremendous healing effects, anti-inflammatory effects, good for optimizing brain and physical performance, and Scott's about to share with you uh, what it's all about. So he has got a very interesting story, which we're going to start off with. So Scott, thank you so much for giving us your time to jump on board and do this interview. Appreciate My pleasure, it. Neil. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here with you. Excellent. Yeah, we had such an interesting conversation last week. I really enjoyed our conversation. I love your story. I love the fact that you went from kind of being brought up in a kind of alternative way, alternative health, and then you yes, went in. Yeah, and then you kind of went down the the Western or rather conventional route, didn't you, to get qualified? And then you're kind of bridging the gap. So yeah. I'd love to talk about that. Yeah. So I grew up pretty alternatively as it goes. My father's a chiropractor, grew up in New York, and I saw what health looked like when it was outside the box. Looking at diet, looking at exercise, looking at movement chiropractic, uh, I really do feel was kind of the original functional medicine practice as we describe functional medicine now. That word didn't exist in, until maybe about 10 or 15 years ago now, really. Mm. And I saw how beautiful it could be. I saw how easy it could be to really help people from a lifestyle behavior perspective. But as a chiropractor, I did also notice that there were some limitations as to what my dad could do. It was some of the capabilities that he had with his patients and and I, I also realized that there was a, probably a big bridge that could be made between conventional and alternative health. And so I actually ended up going to medical school, the dark side, as it were, at the time, um, really with the idea of trying to bridge that gap, trying to figure out how I could focus my, my practice when I finished medical school and, my, and my, my residency or my training to find a way to bridge that gap in, in, in a focused way. And uh, it was actually a very strange place that I found it my first epiphany, I would say, um, it, which was in a trauma center at the University of Maryland in Baltimore. And so if those of you who don't know about Baltimore, it's a place where some place where a show called The Wire was filmed uh, ah. on HBO many years ago. Great show. Uh, Baltimore has a significant underbelly of crime and of gunshot wounds and trauma. And so there's this big, actually very famous trauma center called the Shock Trauma Center there. And as a third-year medical student, you have to do a, a rotation there where you're on call for 30 hours every three days. And you get to be very proud in your pink scrubs. So, you know, scrubs, right? You wear in a hospital. You get yeah. pink ones at shock trauma. It's pretty interesting. Everybody's walking right. around in their pink scrubs. Some are see-through, which is a little bit weird, to be honest. But uh, <laughs> um, uh, I, don't, I don't know. It's a bit interesting. But anyway, it's, uh, it's a very proud culture, very, uh, very great, great facility. And, but they have this gigantic chamber in the basement, which I had no idea what it was until I had a couple of patients that came in with flesh eating bacteria, necrotizing fasciitis. And they threw them in this chamber. And when they came out of the chamber, um, their tissue had went from looking like it was going to fall off and die to actually looking like it was pink and going to be salvageable. So saving limbs from being amputated. I also saw some patients with carbon monoxide poisoning go into the chamber intubated, so basically on ventilators and walk out of the chamber. And when I saw these things happening, I asked the technicians wow. in the docks and I was like, what, what is going on in there? I mean, it's this gigantic submarine looking thing. <clears throat> and they just said it was oxygen and pressure. And when they said that to me, I'm like, that's it? That's all it is? And they said, yeah. And so my epiphany was, well, what if you could use oxygen and pressure to heal other injuries and help other conditions rather than just some of this acute stuff. And that's where my deep dive into hyperbaric oxygen therapy began. And when I saw what was happening across the world, especially in places like Japan and Russia, even in Europe, and some of the studies happening actually in Canada and other locations, of course, outside the United States where I, where I, where I live, um, I realized that there was a lot of potential for this particular therapy to bridge that gap that I've been looking to do. Amazing. That's incredible. So can you uh, describe how it works? I saw these featured on the Truth About Cancer series a few mm -hmm. years ago because mm -hmm. they're really effective in uh, kind of, well, in cancer therapy, <laughs> cancer treatment, aren't they? Right. Yeah. Uh, so 
it's super simple. And that's the beauty of it, Neil. It's just a combination of increased atmospheric pressure and increased oxygen that you breathe. It all happens through breath. It all happens through as you inspire oxygen, you, you breathe in oxygen. We can pressurize that oxygen in a chamber, simulating the pressure that you would be if you were, for example, swimming under the, the water. Okay. So water itself is actually quite heavy. If you pick up a bucket of water, carry it around, it's, it's super heavy. But when you're floating underneath it, if you're diving or whatever, if you're scuba diving or even snorkeling or even in a pool and you're under five or 10 feet of water, all that water is ex actually quite heavy. And that water changes uh, the pressure that your body's under because of all that weight. And we're just simulating that pressure in the chambers. It's the combination of the pressure and the oxygen that drives more oxygen into the body, into circulation. So typically, as most of your viewers, and I'm sure you know, Neil, that oxygen's carried on red blood cells in our body. And that's what gives us our oxygen carrying capacity. So if you're, if you're a biker, you know, if you're a cyclist, or even if you're an elite athlete, you're always working on improving your oxygen carrying capacity. In this respect, the red blood cells are usually the rate limiting step. And that's why you have cyclists like Lance Armstrong and others that are giving themselves more red blood cells, either by transfusing themselves more of their own blood before races illegally, or taking something like Ebogen, which is a stimulator of red blood cells uh, to, make, to be made in your body. Hyperbaric therapy doesn't work by red blood cells. It actually diffuses oxygen directly into the plasma of the blood. So if there are any more sites on the red blood cells that need oxygen, which is rare in somebody that's normal, that has normal lungs, they actually will saturate those sites. But the real power of hyperbaric therapy is in the saturation in the liquid of our blood or the plasma, because there's very little oxygen in it at sea level. And sea level oxygen percentage, just for those of you who don't know, is 21%. So the air that you and I are breathing at sea level is only 21% oxygen. That is enough oxygen for us to saturate most of the red blood cells with oxygen as they go through your lungs and you breathe. If you use 100% oxygen and you pressurize that oxygen in a hyperbaric chamber, you can drive up to 1,200% or more oxygen into circulation, okay? Whoa. Bypassing the red blood cells. They've done studies, not in humans, but in animals, showing that if you pressurize a, an animal to three ATA, which is equivalent of 66 feet of seawater, you no longer need red blood cells to actually allow these animals to function normally because you can diffuse so much oxygen in circulation just in the plasma without red blood cells, okay? That's insane. Wow. So, so that's the power of it from an oxygen perspective. And then the question is, you know, what does that do? Why would you want that, right? Because some people worry about oxygen, right? Is that too much oxygen, for example? Um, but the power of it is in the physiologic and sort of catalytic shifts that happen related to that oxygen infusion. And all that is happening on two different levels. The first level is in sort of the acute infusion of oxygen. And the second level is the epigenetic changes or the changes that happen to your DNA as a result of that oxygen infusion. Incredible. I'm happy to talk more about that. If Can you, you but, yeah. just two seconds. Some, there's yeah. a bit of rustling with, the, with your cable, I think. Oh, I'm getting too excited, probably. Okay. <laughs> oh, maybe, that's better. That's, okay. that's cool. I'll hold it. Um, can you just, you just touched on epigenetics, which is such a massive topic. Can you just give a, like your best you know, elevator pitch of what epigenetics is? Because this is such a huge thing for people to understand. And uh, mm -hmm. I, yeah, I talk about it a lot, but I'd love you to just share what this is. Yeah, mean. there's, a, there's, a, uh, there's a many more experts uh, that are much smarter about epigenetics than me. My very dumbed down understanding of it um, compared to a lot of my friends is that you know, we have a genetic code. We have DNA. That doesn't change. But the expression of the proteins and the other transcription factors, basically what gets transcribed from the DNA changes depending on the environment and depending on our exposures in our environment. So we have the ability to actually modulate that by what we do externally. So we are, we are not 
sort of beholden to our DNA. And I think that's an important factor when you're looking at some of the genetic testing out there that says yeah. that you're at risk for Alzheimer's or diabetes or, uh, or any other number of conditions. That nothing is a, des- uh, you know, is a sentence in the sense that you don't, you're not relegated to your genes. You have the environmental stimuli, which is as powerful or even more powerful, likely, than just your DNA itself. So epigenetics is the study of the environmental uh, impact of how your DNA transcribes proteins that make your body work, basically. Amazing. And environment doesn't have to be outside. It's your internal environment. Yes, so it's, it's what we eat. It's how we move. It's how we manage emotions, like stress, and you know, release everything. Trauma. So it's everything like inside the body. This is such a huge point because we're often asked, you know, by a doctor, do you, is there any history of cancer in the family or diabetes in the family? Right. And we, we we kind of immediately attach a meaning to that, thinking, oh, we're going to get that. But when we when you understand about epigenetics, you're like, ah, oh, I've got the power to effectively turn on or off those those genes. Right. By the environment that I have in my body. Right. So I like to think of it like if we if we do what our parents did and, you know, they both had cancer or heart disease or something, then we have a, a high likelihood of developing that same thing. Right. However, if we choose to do something different, maybe the, the exact opposite. Right. Then there's no reason why we should actually develop anything like that. A hundred percent. Yeah. And then, and it's important for others to, for people to also realize that you know, epigenetic markers or changes can be transgenerational, like you said, mm-hmm. right? So for example, they've done studies on Holocaust survivors and oh, wow. their stress response passed on to their children and children's children is wow. all out of whack. It's all uh, dysregulated because of the stress response that occurred during their ancestors time in a concentration camp for example so so interesting yeah i mean epigenetic changes are transgenerational but that doesn't mean that they are static in the sense that you can't change them they are but you have to it's good to understand that these patterns so for example like a great example on the opposite side of things is that you see your 95 year old grandfather who smoked a pack of cigarettes a day and was healthy until the day he died and then he just, you know, woke up, didn't wake up one morning, right? And then you go, how did that person do it? And it most likely had nothing to do with them. It had all to do with sort of the ancestral line of epigenetic changes that had occurred that allowed him to beat himself up to a pulp, but still keep going. Like a George Burns character, for example, is, is a common one that we think about here in the U.S. And so you have a lot of, so like I, you see, I see this in the hospital sometimes when I work there, like how are these people still alive? And there's nothing to do with, with them per se. It has everything to do with all the epigenetic changes, all the epigenetic aspects of their DNA that have been passed on for generations. So that can work for you and it can work against you. Um, yeah. but, but the beauty of it is in either case, you have the power to change that with, like you said, Neil, with the internal and the external environments that you can modulate. And that, that starts <clears throat> very basically, but it can get to much more you know, complex understanding. But very basically, it's lifestyle, it's environment, it's behavior, all the things that you mentioned. And, and hyperbaric therapy itself is an epigenetic uh, modulator uh, that can improve your body's ability to utilize oxygen. And that's a good thing. And it also epigenetically changes the DNA to upregulate or increase genes that are responsible for growth and decreasing inflammation and downregulating genes that are responsible for inflammation and mm. programmed cell death or apoptosis. So, mm. and the uh, sort of the how that looks on the cellular level is that it improves something called angiogenesis. It improves blood vascular growth. And when you can improve blood vascular growth in an area that's been injured, you can now get more nutrients and more of you know, the body's sort of needed. Uh, factors to that area to help it be vital. So, you know, we see this in patients that have had strokes, for example, or traumatic brain injuries, or in patients that have had um, like a dysregulation of blood flow from like a neurologic presentation, like reflex sympathetic dystrophy. So you can see all of that epigenetically changing on the DNA level. So on the epigenetic level in this case, and then you can see how those changes can actually improve sort of real time clinical 
conditions, right? So that's, that's the power of hyperbaric therapy in sort of like the epigenetic mindset. But on the acute side, even if you have an acute injury, um, what you want to do really in that case is you want to get oxygen to the area to prevent a lot of the sort of downstream issues happening if you don't have oxygen getting to an area. So if you have an acute stroke or if you have an acute injury and you have a lot of swelling and you have a lot of inflammation, hyperbaric therapy can really do three things almost immediately. That's reverse hypoxia or reverse low oxygen. It can decrease inflammation immediately and it can decrease or actually um, it can decrease swelling. And the fourth thing is it fights bacteria. It fights bugs too. It can fight infection. That's so powerful. Can you just bear with me two secs? I just realized that my lead isn't plugged in. <laughs> um, the, when I was at the Truth About Cancer Live Symposium um, a couple of years ago, there, there was a doctor, and I can't, can't for the life of me remember his name now, but he said the number one reason for chronic disease is under-oxygenation of cells. So that's interesting because you're like, you're addressing yeah. that very thing. Like, if there's no oxygen, then you're, you're going to develop inflammation and all, all, lots of other problems. Whereas if you're pumped full of oxygen, if you're moving and you're breathing lots, and ultimately we're, we're living very sedentary lives these days compared right. with how it should be. So we tend to be under-oxygenated. So you're like, you're hitting that number one life fuel, ultimately, aren't you? Right. I think what we're doing is we're optimizing energy production and then we're decreasing inflammation at the same time. So by doing those, it's kind of along that same parallel as that, uh, as that doctor was, was talking about, is that and we're looking at hyperbaric therapy as a reverse aging strategy. And we're looking at that from a stem cell release perspective because hyperbaric therapy actually releases stem cells from the bone marrow where they're actually made and also releases stem cells from neurologic tissue to go to areas of injury, inflammation, and help basically mitigate those things. And so we know it also increases blood vascular growth. And so if you combine sort of the decreased inflammation, the energy optimization at the mitochondrial level, the, the new blood vessels that are forming, it's a reverse aging strategy. And reverse aging also includes an anti-cancer strategy, most likely. And we've even been sort of modulating some of the work that's been done in the cancer world uh, that you probably heard about during the Truth About Cancer series about modulating that for like basically a pre-cancer or an anti-cancer protocol to understand how you can best optimize your cellular function. Because we all know that you know, cancers are happening all the time in our body. And what we do is we have an immune system that functions well enough that gets rid of it. So what if you had anti-cancer strategies using hyperbaric therapy. So we're looking at combining hyperbaric oxygen therapy with the ketogenic diet, for example. And some of this work has been done clinically in, in, in animals. And some actually really interesting case studies that are being reported from a clinic in Turkey, for actually, that, that are doing a, a combination of hyperbaric therapy, chemotherapy, and uh, the ketogenic diet, and looking at uh, glioblastoma, for example, uh, really bad brain cancer, and having some pretty significant outcomes, actually, in, in improving quality of life and, and length of life. So, um, so pretty, pretty interesting work. But if you look at it even sort of earlier in the process of what if you could prevent cancer using the same kind of protocol? And so we're, we're looking at more of this preclinically, sort of you know, not in a study variety mm. yet, but I have optimal performers that are, that are coming in and asking about a combination of keto and, and hyperbaric therapy to get rid of any cancer cells that might be hanging around and may cause an issue down the line. That's fascinating. Have you ever, have you ever combined it with uh, CBD oils or, or even THC and CBD? Yeah. That's going to be yeah. huge, isn't it? If you, yeah. <laughs> those yeah, I mean, protocols and... I, yeah. I live in California now, so anything's yeah, possible around here. Right? So, <laughs> yeah. But yes, I have, I have a couple of colleagues and that specialize in, in CBD and, and CBD and THC mixtures or combinations, yeah. ratios, et cetera. And so, yeah, I think that there is a significant synergistic effect. The way I think about hyperbaric oxygen therapy is it's a massive synergizer and a massive accelerator for healing and for uh, revitalization. So if you're looking at other therapies or other supplements in this, in this case that can also do something very similar, I've had a lot of success combining them. So mm. um, 
so CBD is one of those, especially for brain injury, I have had. A lot of patients improve with, with CBD along with hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And then if you throw uh, a ketogenic diet in or, or just modified uh, Atkins diet on top, I've had a lot of success in these patients actually having significant recoveries. And so uh, CBD is something that's also anti-inflammatory, as you know. It's anxiolytic, so it helps with anxiety, which is really nice. And so, uh, and then the THC also seems to activate the CBD a little bit, according to some of my colleagues in, in the field. And so not having huge amounts of THC in there, so it's not psychoactive, but having enough in there that it activates the CBD seems to be kind of the sweet spot it's looking like, although the research is still being done. Mostly my colleagues in Israel are doing that actually, and now a little bit more in, in, um, in California too. But I think Israel is one of the few places in the world where you can actually do research in humans on with THC and, and CBD, interestingly enough. Oh, I see. Right. Interesting. They also have the largest hyperbaric oxygen chamber facility in the world. They're treating 200 patients a day at a facility just out of Tel Aviv. And so they're doing a lot of amazing work. And a lot of the research that's been coming out over the last several years has been through that actually particular program. Incredible. Have you ever worked with anyone with, with stroke damage by any chance? Yeah. Yeah. We're seeing a lot more patients that are coming through and it's pretty amazing what can happen because if you imagine if somebody's had a stroke, I like to imagine a still lake without any water moving and you throw a rock into it and the, where the rock impacts, that's where the massive damage of the stroke has happened. But the ripples around that are much larger than the direct impact itself. That's where tissue in this case has been damaged, but it's not dead. If the tissue is dead, it's not coming back. But all in that ripple area, that's where that tissue has been stunned or it's been damaged, but it hasn't been fully killed off. Mm. And that's where you can revitalize. That all can be brought back to life. And that's where hyperbaric therapy can work. In the acute setting, in the initial setting just after a stroke, if you reoxygenate that area, you prevent those cells from dying. And that's brain tissue that you're preventing from dying. And in fact, there's going to be a study coming out in the next, I think, several months that's coming out of China that looked at patients with acute strokes that got into hyperbaric chambers, I think just about 72 hours post having the event. They had a significant improvement in morbidity or in disability and a significant improvement in survival after just a, a after a hyperbaric oxygen therapy course post-stroke. So we see that on the acute wow. side already. And then I've had patients with chronic strokes, so six months to three years later, or even longer, having significant benefit getting into the chamber and having a protocol of hyperbaric therapy. Absolutely. Right. So that peri-ischemic area, we call it, um, we call it the ischemic penumbra. That's another word we use for it in the medical world. It's the area of tissue around the direct impact of the stroke where you have a lot of potential for reversing that damage. Incredible. People, everyone needs to know about this. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean and, so, and, and traumatic brain injury, for example, too, Neil. Yeah, so, yeah. I mean, it's a big one we see here in the U.S. And it's, I think, the number one cause of disability in people 45 years of young, or younger in the world is a traumatic brain injury. And above 45, it's actually stroke. And I know hyperbaric therapy can have a dramatic benefit to both of those categories of people. And so when we're looking at, at, at cancer, like you were mentioning before, some of that research is just, on, just sort of getting started. But we know hyperbaric therapy can synergize with almost any cancer therapy. So chemotherapy, for example, you can get more chemotherapeutic drug to the area that needs it because you're hyperoxygenating and you're hypervascularizing, so getting more blood vascular flow to the tumor itself so more chemotherapy can be delivered. If it's radiation, radiation is oxygen sensitive. So you need oxygen to get that radiation to the tissue that you want it to actually radiate. And so hyperbaric therapy can help you get more oxygen to the area, can help kill more cancer cells. It also, if you've got a cancer surgery, for example, hyperbaric therapy is going to help that surgical bed heal faster. This is not even just a cancer surgery. This is any surgery. So I have people yeah, with yeah. knees and hips and, you know, Tommy John surgeries, if they're baseball players here in the U S if they're, if their ACLs are broken or repaired, they can get healed faster, like 50% faster. Yeah. 
Wow. So it's yeah. actually quite impressive. Um, yeah. So cancer surgeries, um, and we talk about the ketogenic diet and, and the com combination of hyperbaric therapy. We're exploring things like IV vitamin C, CBD, uh, DCA. I mean, I can just like lots of initials, it's but real acronyms. Yeah, yeah, lots. Of, but anyway, it's yeah. there's lots, lots going on. One thing I should mention, though, Neil, because I get this question a lot from from patients as well as doctors, is you know, what about all that oxygen? It could it potentially make the cancer grow? And it's a really it's a valid question. Mm. And what it comes down to is that they've done a number of reviews looking at the potential of hyperbaric therapy causing cancer to grow. And there's absolutely no indication that that is the case. And I think the reason for that is that cancer blood vessels grow in a very different environment. They grow typically in a hypoxic or a low oxygen environment and very yeah. unregulated. And so hyperbaric therapy does not work uh, on the same level. It works by increasing the amount of oxygen and epigenetic changes that cause more vessels to be uh, produced, more blood vessels to be to grow, but it doesn't work in the same way. And so some of the reviews have looked at this very point, and there's no indication that hyperbaric therapy has any pro-cancer growth effect. In fact, if anything, it has a static effect or no effect. And in some cancers by itself, it probably has a mild regressive effect in breast cancer and in, in brain cancer called glioblastoma. But you combine it with chemo radiation on the conventional side, or on the alternative side, you combine it with the ketogenic diet uh, or other strategies, there is a potential to have uh, cancer mitigating or even cancer regressive effects. Amazing. So cool. You reminded me of uh, our mutual friend, Christina. I think oh, she, yeah. that was a therapy that she was going to have for her father, but sadly he chose <clears throat> not to follow it as ketogenic diet and the hyperbaric oxygen therapy. I'll definitely do that if I have a, a diagnosis. Um, the ketogenic diet's hard. It's hard. Uh, and it was a lot harder four or five years ago when I first started doing this because there wasn't nearly as many resources as there are now to, to really be able to do it. Getting in the chamber is easy, Neil, in, in a lot of ways yeah, because yeah. you just get in there and you hang out. Uh, but what, what's challenging on my side is that, and this is a point to, that needs to be made, it's not like you get into a chamber one time and all of these beautiful things happen like that I'm mentioning. It's usually a protocol of therapy. Yeah. Epigenetic changes don't happen in a day. Typically they happen over a period of a period of time. And with oxygen exposure, in this case, we're talking about protocols that can be 20, 40 treatments long. If you're looking for those epigenetic changes on the acute side, if you're looking at an acute injury or an acute need, uh, for a, for an oxygen stimulus, one to three tra treatments can really have a significant benefit. So patients that have had brain injuries, or they've just had surgery, or they've just had some sort of you know low oxygen stimulus, whatever that may be, they can reverse that very fast in a chamber in two, three, five treatments. But if they've had a long-standing issue, a chronic issue, it takes a longer time not only to just reoxygenate but also re create that scaffolding, that sort of that, that uh, tissue bed that's vital and healthy that allows that cellular environment to be healthy over the long term. It's important right. to make that, make that clear. Yeah, yeah. And I guess that's kind of expected. If it, it often takes many, many years for these things to actually develop. So we can't expect for them to just go overnight. Right. Well, the American way and I think the English way is like, you know, what's the quick fix, right? Yeah, quick How fix. can I... <laughs> How can I get? And so I do work yeah. on that level and think about ways to optimize these protocols. It's not just about hyperbaric therapy, as I've, I think we chatted about offline. You know, yeah, is yeah. That hyperbaric therapy, is a, it's, it's a massive synergizer. It's a massive accelerator, decreasing inflammation, wound healing, reversing hypoxia, killing bugs. But if you put it in a larger context, that's where the power of this is. If you look at some of the other potential out there. So you look at other technologies, potentially. You look at other practitioners that might be helpful. So like if it's a brain injury, for example, you're looking at maybe a cranial sacral therapist or an osteopath that's working on that detoxification. Oxygen. You did that? Yeah. Are you a fan of cranial sacral work? Well, if it was the right thing, they just kind of stood there <laughs> for about <laughs> half an hour just, just holding space around my head i was like uh -huh. 
Uh, <laughs> what's going on? <laughs> I so they didn't actually. They didn't actually I had, a really nice massage, I had a nice massage to start off with. Okay. And then, uh, which was amazing. Mm-hmm. But then when it went to my actual head, they she just kind of held this space and she was waiting mm-hmm. for pulses to happen in my head. Really? And I was like, I, one of my friends could do this. <laughs> Can you do something now? <laughs> ah, but she was doing something, but it was metaphysical, my friend. It yes, like... <laughs> yes, exactly. exactly. That, that's, not, yeah. that's not classically craniosacral work, but that sounds like more sort of craniosacral healing, maybe. I don't know. Um, but typically what I talk about is actually, is, is actually manip- is lymphatic massage, sort of, you know, the spinal yeah. alignment because the yeah. idea is that you want to heal, but you also need a detox, right? So yeah. your spinal fluid needs to circulate, allowing the, the, the C1, C2 to be aligned. Uh, so your first two vertebrae in the cervical column, um, allowing your spinal cord to have good sort of spinal flush is what you're looking at there. Um, and I've and I had a lot of success. I've had a lot of success with patients when they do a combined approach. They're looking at practitioners like cranial sacral therapists, looking at other technologies like, for example, low level light therapy is a really powerful one. Have you had any experience with those? I've done infrared saunas. Yeah, uh, and I've got I've got a, a near infrared sauna um, so like single I. panel light from a friend of mine in. Uh, you might even know him. He's in. Where is he? So anyway, it's, it's irrelevant. <laughs> but yeah. he's got a, he's got a company called Sauna Space. <laughs> okay, and uh, it, it, he's uh, he's getting these incredible results for his clients, or rather, wow. his clients are getting incredible results with his with, uh, his, with his lights. With, yes, and Doctor McCullough has just given him a really awesome approval as well. Oh, so, nice. yeah, it's, it's all these different um, modalities and approaches, isn't it? It's like the holistic way. You just you, you, you tackle every angle, right? You, you toxify right. the body and pump oxygen through it and wonderful things can happen. You, t- you yes. talked about lymphatic massages then, because that's, that's huge. Because even, you know, there, there are some cancers which are just kind of a result of the lymph system just being blocked, aren't they, sometimes? Yeah, and yeah. It's, and then, uh, in the chamber, you get a your lymphatic pump too. So the lymph system is what detoxifies our body. And it's in these vessels that are in our brain. They're, they're throughout the rest of our body. And, and in fact... We just found out about these lymphatic vessels in our brain, although we kind of knew they already existed. We knew that the brain had to detoxify, but the, the glymphatic system was just discovered maybe in the last couple of years. But without lymphatic flow, everything gets stagnant in sort of the Chinese philosophy, ancient philosophies of sort of stagnation. And as a result of that, you have these bad humors develop and you have disease or dis-ease in this, in yeah. this respect. So- Um, lymphatic flow is huge, right? But I think what it comes down to is that if you don't look at this sort of from a foundational perspective, so what's the foundational health of the human being of the, of this body that you have, if the foundation isn't there, no matter what you do, if it's hyperbaric therapy, if it's, if it's low level light therapy, if it's infrared sauna, uh, if you're not going to that foundational level, and this is what I've discovered over the last couple of years, Neil, is that I, you can make improvements. Patients can feel a lot better. Um, but a lot of times if they haven't worked on that foundation, that they slowly go back to the way they were, right? Yeah. Um, and sometimes it's a fast <laughs> ramp down. Yeah, yeah. Other times it takes a much longer ramp down. It just depends on the person. It depends on where they came from. For example, I mean, I've had patients with Alzheimer's disease, right, um, that have done very well in, in the hyperbaric chambers. Their memory comes back. They feel better, but they don't want to change anything else. They don't want to change their diet. They don't want to look at a foundational health. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So like their brain comes on for like five or six months and then they kind of go back. Right. So, um, be as hyperbaric. So they continue to do what caused them the problem in the first place. Right. It's it's like Einstein's definition of insanity, isn't it? Expecting different results, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting different results. Yeah. Well, this is what's happening in the world of performance now. And, and, and you have to be careful, right? Because you have, you have like stem cell, you can get IV stem cells now. You can go to Mexico. Here in the U.S., you can just go down to Mexico and get umbilical stem cells. You can go other places. And they help for a short period of time, even if you don't do anything else. Right? Yeah. You'll, you'll feel better. 
you'll be thinking better, you'll have less inflammation. But then every three months, you have to go back to Mexico for $20,000 a pop to get yeah. your, your stem cell fix. And that's probably not a good plan in the long term, even if you have the money, honestly. So yeah. what I've been developing with a couple of colleagues is, uh, and I mentioned this to you offline, you know, is, is a foundational approach to health called uh, health optimization medicine, which looks at this, uh, looks at the cellular health of the organism, in this case, us, and balances by measuring, balancing, detoxifying, and not treating disease, but actually just treating health and just making sure that our epigenetics are as optimal as possible by looking at all these foundational things like your gut, looking at food sensitivities from an evolutionary biology perspective as well on a diet side, looking at hormone health, and then looking at what's called metabolomic health or your, your met metabolism mm -hmm. and how well your cells are making energy. And if you do that, uh, those four pieces there, like that is the foundation. That is, it's, that's sort of the core of our, of, of our body. Am I back? Sorry. You're back. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. I thought I lost you for a second. Um, right. That's sort of the core of, of our body's health. And so we've been starting there and we've been having some powerful, powerful transformations in people. And then on top of that, hyperbaric therapy is, is, is like the icing on the cake. That's fascinating, Scott. So super cool. And uh, yeah, all about balancing the body and optimizing the body at the core, at the foundational level. I, uh, I'd love to talk to you about getting certified in that because it sounds yeah. so good. Yeah. yeah. So, and just to, to mention briefly, so health optimization medicine was founded by my colleague. His name is, is Dr. Ted Atacoso. And Dr. Ted is He's a brilliant guy. Uh, he grew up in the Philippines, but he has a practice now in the Philippines along with DC, and he also practices in Europe. He calls it a tri-continental practice. And uh, he's one of those special human beings that was able to, I think, whittle down what the core foundation all we, we all need. And he actually took out the genomics. Like he took out that part because like we discussed earlier, Genomics is important, but it's not as important as what's happening real time at the cellular level, because yeah. that's really where you can actually have an effect epigenetically. You can, you can work on your gut health. You can work on your hormonal health. You can work on the foods that you eat to make sure that you're not getting inflamed to them. Part of that is just healing your gut, right? If you yeah. heal your gut, you're going to be less inflamed and probably tolerate more foods anyway. Yeah, most so of my kind of, program is about healing the gut. Yeah, right. Right, exactly. Yeah. So, and, and that's really where it starts. So if you can take like 80% of the benefit in 20% of the typical functional medicine testing, that's pretty far. The rest of the 20% still requires an integrative doctor, a functional medicine doctor, or maybe even an allopathic or conventional doc. It doesn't negate the need for those doctors. I think what it does is it makes their jobs easier. And I don't think anybody wants mm. a harder job. They, they want an easier job, uh, or at least not a, an easier job in the sense of, you know, twiddling their thumbs, but in the sense of having bigger impacts, having more powerful results. And if you're health optimized, you're more resilient, you have better energy. And even though we don't make any claims as to, you know, diseases per se, but what you can see is that some of these conditions potentially can either be mitigated or go away because now yeah. you have a foundational approach. And part of the approach also, Neil, is that we're not just optimizing and balancing to the levels of the laboratory value normals that you would see on a regular blood panel that you would get at your doctor's office. The idea is to normalize to somebody at their optimal state. And for human beings, that optimal state is somewhere between 21 and 32 or 21 and 34 years of age, because that's when we were supposed to be at our procreating capacity our maximal capacity at our fighting strength and be at our most resilient. So the idea is to create normals that are within that range for each of these tests. So tests for gut, tests for hormones, tests for cellular energy, uh, tests for um, food sensitivities. That's a little bit different, but the first, the first three, especially you're looking at normal levels of somebody, the age group that you're at your max capacity for resilience energy and overall vitality 
Vitality. I love. I was, I was about to fill in. The- I knew that you wanted that <laughs> word in there, so I was going to throw that in there for you. Throw it in there. <laughs> That's a good word. Yeah. It's important. Energy is a huge thing, and you know, you, t- you talked about the mitochondria earlier, right? And a lot of people who aren't familiar with that probably don't quite understand what it is. I mean, it's. C- can you just quick, very quickly explain it? Because what you're doing here is optimizing the mitochondria of the cells, isn't it? Right. Can you just give a quick description of what? I know we're going on quite a long time, but if you could just talk about the mitochondria very quickly. That's no problem. Um, in brief, and, and Dr. Ted, my colleague, I think has the best explanation for this. Uh, the mitochondria are the batteries of your cell. They're basically what give your cells energy and power uh, to work. All the processes that your cell undergoes require energy. Every process vitality. Every, and vitality, sure. <laughs> um, <laughs> All the processes that, that occur in your body require energy, ATP, which is the currency of energy in our body. And the mitochondria are what make that. If you have healthy mitochondria, you make energy efficiently and you make it in the quantities that you need. If you don't have healthy mitochondria, you don't make it efficiently. That means you make a lot of garbage products and that's not good for your health. And then you don't make them in, in quantities that you need. And if that's the case, your body starts degenerating. And over time, as we get, as we age and as more toxins build up and as our gut gets more dysbiotic, like the dysbiosis yeah. brings up or comes up or just more bad bacteria, bad diversity, um, these mitochondria get less healthy because we know that mitochondria really are what we, uh, they're really just bacteria, right? That have been co-opted by ourselves millions and millions of years ago for energy. So they need to be looked at in the same way. Right. So they need we need to like think about them as part of us, but also separate from us in some ways. And so we have to look at them um, and understand they have their own DNA and they have their own ways of replicating. And they probably have a significant role in cancer uh, as well. And so it's really important that we focus on our mitochondrial health and and cellular energy is what they do. And so that's what we're optimizing in health optimization medicine. And that's what we're optimizing in, in the hyperbaric chamber too. We are improving oxygen utilization to make energy. The key is to be able to do that efficiently over the long term, And that requires a fully integrative or functional approach for full vitality, Neil. For Love it. Vitality. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. That's incredible. You're like, you're optimizing the life force of the human body, which is ultimately oxygen and energy. <laughs> Very, very cool. We are energy. That is for sure. We are energy. Yeah. Scott, thank you so much. This has been amazing. I realize um, it's gone over an hour now. Oh, almost. is it that long? Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I try and keep these to like 40 minutes. Right on. The concentration spans. But um, I, I could talk to you for hours. I think that's probably quite clear. But uh, thank you so much for sharing. Where can they find you? What's your website? Sure. So more to come, Neil. We'll ha- we can have more conversations going forward if you wish. Yeah, I'd be happy that. to. And um, so for me, you can find me at integrativehbot.com, which is the word integrative and the letters HBOT together. Or you can just Google my name, Scott Scherr, S-H-E-R-R-M-D, and all my links will pretty much come up. Um, I'm at, on Twitter at, at Dr. Scherr, D-R-S-H-E-R-R. We're also on Facebook, both the integrative site as well as Health Optimization Medicine. Uh, you can find it there. And then there's also healthoptimizationmedicine.org. So that's a lot of potential places. But um, <laughs> you, can, you can find us a lot of places. And we're here to change the paradigm of health, you and oh. I both. And I think my microcosm of that is hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Uh, my larger umbrella for that now is health optimization medicine, because we're going to be certifying doctors and practitioners like yourself, Neil, uh, across the world to practice health optimization medicine with their clients, along with the other great work that you do already and that others do. It's going to be an amazing synergistic foundational approach. And so I'm excited that you're interested and that others I know will be. So we're coming out with that in the next six months or so. All of that is getting online and on board. And so stay tuned. Amazing. Scott, that's really amazing work you're doing. The, uh, finally, you, do you have a physical location where people can actually come for this? 
you know, therapy. I have lots of metaphysical locations, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but my, my physical location is actually in San Francisco. So I live okay. just about 30 minutes south. And so I see clients in offices in San Francisco, in Los Altos, which is in the, like the Silicon Valley area. And yeah. that I also have affiliations with hyperbaric clinics in New York, New York City, Long Island, Oregon. London? London, London not, I, I know the guys that own the facility in London, but I'm not directly affiliated with them. But there is a facility in London. It's been around a long time, actually, by one of the pioneers in hyperbaric medicine. I think it's been taken over by some younger cats that are, that are doing their thing. But I'm not, I'm not entirely clear on, on exactly what their setup is. They have, um, they have hard hyperbaric chambers, so the, the medical grade chambers as well. Okay. Um, and so there's definitely some options in London for you. Brilliant. And then Good I also that. have affiliations in LA, in Georgia, in some other locations across the US and the world, actually. So Israel has got the largest program that I mentioned. And uh, there are some other, other places in Australia and some other locations too. Superb. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Scott. It's been, it's been my been pleasure. Really, yeah. Uh, yeah, really inspiring, very educational, interesting. And I'm uh, on again do it now. <laughs> Cheers. We'll talk about it soon. We'll get you in. Thanks, Scott. All right. Bye now. Bye.